Uh, I left school when I was uh, 16, actually. I finished in the Irish system at the age of 16, believe it or not. And uh, at that stage, I, had, I didn't have much of an idea of what I wanted to do. Um, but I knew I was sort of practically minded and sort of enjoyed sort of making things and doing things. And uh, I got into engineering and uh, I did a technician course in Queens, or sorry, in Dublin. And then uh, I luckily, because of the Anglo-Irish agreement and improved political relations north and south, I ended up in university in Belfast at Queens in Belfast and graduated from there. And I think it, it sort of set the, the scene. I was luckily enough, lucky enough to be offered so many opportunities and possibilities throughout my career, largely by Arab, by individuals and by the company. Um, and I'm still receiving those 25 years later and I think that's going to come into the talk quite a bit. Um, and it, you know, I'm, I'm a, I have a very positive outlook, but I'd like to show this slide because in the attic of this house is a, a letter from Arab saying uh, they'd hold over my CV and get back to me if they wanted to give me a job. Basically a rejection letter, but I still managed to get in. Um, within a year of joining Arab, I found myself living in tropical rainforest in Cameroon um, and basically designed and ordered, shipped, uh, the components of a 110 meter span cable suspension walkway uh, into a national park in Cameroon um, and went out there with a number of volunteers and built it. And this was my first introduction to voluntary work in the international scene. I did a little bit at home when I was uh, younger. But basically, um, <coughs> I was interested in this. It was for a voluntary organization. It was actually primarily a youth organization. And, you know, I just sent a letter to my director in Dublin and said, uh, you know, there's this opportunity, can I go? And uh, can I leave, you know, for three or four months? And he wrote back and he said, fine, and uh, we'll cover, we'll continue to pay half of your salary. And I was gobsmacked. I didn't even ask for that. But it was an indication of, of where Arab were coming from. They gave me a job during the worst recession in Irish history until now. And they uh, continued to give me opportunities like that. And it's very much part, it's nothing to do with business really. It's a long-term investment in people. And I've been extremely lucky uh, to grow a beard during that period, which I've not done since. Um, my real education, um, I started in, in university and in college. The uh, architecture was never mentioned. I can safely say architecture and the word architect was not mentioned for the entire five years. Uh, except when we swore about the architects who were also doing an architecture degree in, in Bolton Street in Dublin. I was lucky enough uh, to end up working on the Kemzai Airport project uh, out in Japan for two and a half years and took basically master classes from, from Renzo and uh, Peter Rice, uh, another Irish engineer and a, a partner of Arab at that point. And uh, I was lucky enough to spend two and a half years working with them and including a year out in Osaka and uh, Renzo's contract said he had to spend one week in every five in Japan so it really was uh, my masters if you like in, in design and architecture and uh, an opportunity to learn which I uh, did and I learned many things in Japan and one of those was people's fear of earthquake and fire this is a, a relief from one of the temples in, in, in Japan. And I was also, as I said, it was an education in architecture, uh, uh, the importance of modeling in Renzo's practice and, and many of the practices I've since worked with and I've seen uh, similar operations here in Copenhagen already where the model shop is nearly as big as the floor. This is definitely uh, the environment I want to be working in. We were also, back then in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, doing cutting edge uh, design and analysis, but also uh, geometric definition. The building uh, had a, a complex geometry which we rationalized into a, a toroid. I was also lucky enough to uh, get a bursary and spent five weeks on site uh, during construction. Another opportunity to learn and watch the thing uh, being built and also being fabricated in Japan. Uh, this is one of the main trusses of the building. 
And uh, the more complex steelwork was actually done in the UK. This was the uh, toroidal uh, wings of the airport. Uh, the uh, steelwork for this was produced, was manufactured uh, and shipped to Japan at half the price that Japan thought they might be able to do it at. And uh, it was interesting, the Japanese contractors were not able to do this bit of steelwork, despite having, as one British contractor said, more equipment in one location than there existed in the t entire UK. They still couldn't do this craft work, steel work. And that was a, a very interesting lesson. The work, uh, the steel work delivered and uh, erected on site to create one of the most spectacular uh, new airports at that time, and it still is one of the first, if you like, modern uh, airport designs. Um, it was a project where we saw early CFD work being used to analyse air flows, um, being backed up by physical modelling, um, and continuous study uh, by the architect and the engineer into the craftsmanship of the actual pieces. This uh, piece here is uh, an open air duct blowing fresh air across an open duct in the ceiling of Kansai Airport, delivering air to the general volume of the building. We also uh, did some groundbreaking fire engineering work on the building at the time, and I think it possibly still is the largest single volume uh, in the world without uh, fire breaks. It's uh, over 500,000 cubic meters. And we used fire engineering to demonstrate uh, life safety, but also uh, through time history analysis, we were able to show that the um, tied steel uh, structure of the wing did not need to be fireproofed. And that was a massive saving. You take a building that's 1.6 kilometers long and make a small saving like that, uh, you make a massive uh, saving when you multiply it by 1.6 kilometers. We were also doing groundbreaking work in terms of natural lighting. Uh, again, er using early computer modeling of lighting backed up with physical lighting uh, models. And I think you can see here there was money for research in this project. And uh, unfortunately, in the world we're working in, it's more and more difficult to find the projects where there is the money and the time uh, to, do the, to do this kind of work. Um, and this is the, the final result, one of the images of the main terminal building, but also a lesson in, you know, you can spend all that money in, in studying things like natural lighting but actually end up losing it because you're 40% over budget. So all of the natural lighting in the main terminal building and down the wings was all eliminated. Uh, you know, three work years of work was eliminated in, in you know, 24 hours. Um, so it, that was also uh, quite a lesson, managing budgets. I came back uh, from Japan and uh, after three months on a beach that was empty due to the first Gulf War, which was very nice. And uh, I got introduced to uh, Rem Coolhouse, and that started a, a, a collaboration and a working relationship that uh, has gone on ever since. That was 1991. And I love this project. Again, it was all about learning. And here, the lesson was, uh, how do you do something special in one of the lowest budget projects I've ever worked on? Uh, at the time, this was around five or 600 pounds a square meter uh, budget. It's a, about a 200,000 square meter three use. Uh, it's the Kong Expo, so it's a 5,000 seat uh, Zenith Hall, a uh, concert hall, uh, rock music hall, uh, a conference building, and an expo hall. And, uh, you know, how could we do something special? And, and what we could do was, it was just because of the sheer scale of it, it meant that you, by certain studies and certain manipulation of common materials and common practice, you can actually get something special. Uh, and one of the last things the architect did was, uh, you know, they knew they had a bitumen roof and they asked, you know, well, is there, what colours do you have? And they said, well, there's white and there's black. And they said, well, can we have both? And they said, yeah, it costs no difference. So that, that's why the roof ended up with a, uh, a Frisian cattle, Frisian cow pattern. Um, it was also a lesson from a Kansai Airport, about geometry. Um, I have a lot to say about lobby architecture, but I won't go on about that now. 
but the um, the people become slaves to geometry uh, far too quickly. Uh, far too much of it is, is theoretical as opposed to practical. We had a dished roof here on, uh, as part of the architecture, uh, a three-dimensional dish. And at the time, the architects were going along this pattern, you know, path here, where they were looking at ground level and then how to, connect, how to support the roof and using vertical columns. And uh, in a two-dimensional sense, you end up with a whole variety of uh, dimensions. But by s simply just saying, no, we're just going to slope the columns so that A matches A in the roof, and do that crudely in, in, in two directions. And yes, it, it, it doesn't work out perfectly, but it's close enough. So all we did was transpose a rectilinear grid onto a dish and uh, kept all the elements the same length and took out uh, the vari slight variation due to the dish geometry just in connections and tolerances. And so achieved um, a, a roof that uh, you know, satisfied the client, satisfied our, our requirements to do something uh, special. And uh, it, you know, it was definitely a lesson in how to do things. I'm going to flick on here. One of the other things we did was the, um, the ceiling elements for the building. Um, we, again, we designed something from first principles and ended up making these a uh, elements with a timber uh, soffit uh, in tension, uh, just ordinary steel bar, rebar uh, diagonals and a T-section top. Uh, because there was eight kilometers of it on the job to do the roof, uh, it meant that we could afford to have a testing regime and we built, built a couple of uh, prototypes, uh, tested them, tested them to destruction and were able to produce them within the budget uh, and deliver to site and achieve uh, what was considered at the time a you know, very elegant uh, solution. Another story in, in, in not being a slave to geometry, this is the uh, seating dish for the uh, Zenith Concert Hall. And basically here again, rather than trying to come up with some ingenious uh, system that could deal with the geometry, all we did was took regular rectangular uh, pieces of uh, form uh, and filled in the gaps, sort of laid them out roughly, filled in the gaps and uh, cast the concrete, a lesson uh, I think the French are incredibly uh, useful with concrete. You see ropes here being used because they, the, the slope was so high that uh, they used ropes to pull themselves up while they were casting it. But they cast all of these pieces, each half was passed, uh, cast in 24 hours and ended up, ended up with the soffit I, I showed earlier. Anyway, it was about lessons and I'm going to move on. Um, <clears throat> after those two projects under my belt, I, I started to work with, continue working with OMA, but also with uh, the, the first uh, spin-offs out of OMA, including MVRDV, and worked on their first uh, uh, major commission, the VPRO building in Hilversum, and uh, just when we got scheme design out the door, I said to Winnie that I was off to Tanzania. He wasn't too pleased about that. Uh, again, I found a charity that uh, I was interested in. I was working, helping, and um, I ended up nine months in Tanzania, again sponsored by Arab, and ended up taking part in a social anthropological study. Uh, and as one of my Friends later said, you know, I'd basically done an M MSc or Master's in development work. And I spent a lot of time sleeping on floors of village uh, schoolhouses and uh, gathering information and learning about um, the requirements of very rural communities in, in Tanzania. And I, I put up this detail. This is one of the, one of the shots I like. It's, it, I got very interested in appropriate technology, and I'm going to talk about a little bit more about that in a moment. But uh, th this was an advanced piece of uh, technical innovation in, in Tanzania. Um, it was moving from using purely uh, mud mortar in, in construction, uh, and these are mud bricks, most of them, some might be fired, but in the corners to reinforce uh, the buildings against whirlwinds and also minor earth tremors, used a, a bit of cement in the corner to reinforce it. I thought that's very interesting. Um, 
the theme of voluntary work, having, having done a number of projects, I came back to Arup and uh, got involved in this project. It's known as the Ladakh School. It's in a remote community in, uh, in Jammu Kashmir, uh, up in, in northern India. Very traditional uh, Buddhist community, one of the last remaining sort of intact Buddhist communities in the world. And we were invited, uh, basically we got involved with some architects who were invited by a trust to, to do a master plan for a school um, that was to be built over the next 10, 15 years. And I had a look at their project and said, you know, I, I told them in no uncertain terms, I didn't think very much of what they were doing. And a year later they came back to me and said, uh, um, we're actually going to build this now and will you be the, the engineer? And I said, OK, but only if it uh, becomes an Arab project. And uh, I said, we're going to do it as a voluntary project, but you're going to pay us a fee. And you're going to pay us a fee of one-tenth, about one-tenth of what we actually require. And that's just so that there is a contract. And we will have a fee agreement and a contract with you, so you can expect uh, service and you can expect a response, rather than it uh, just being a, a purely um, gift or a charity. I didn't want a charity job, I wanted a real model for delivering, um, you know, for delivering engineering into situations where there wasn't the money to pay the fees, but, but there was certainly something we could do. I was attracted, uh, so it became a model within the company of how we set up voluntary projects like that, where there are no fees, or very little fees. Um, you know, an immediate attraction for me was to work with uh, traditional um, skills uh, from the area. But, you know, it's nice. It's nice to see. It's nice to, uh, to be involved in that. But what are you actually contributing? Why have someone in London at that time be involved in a project in northern India? And uh, one of the reasons was that there are fantastic uh, traditional local uh, ways of doing a uh, building, but uh, some of them had inherently dangerous uh, consequences. One of the things is uh, you end up with this very complicated mud roof uh, on the uh, buildings there. It's a very complicated layer of, of material, as you can see here, mixed with mud and reeds, and it's built up. But when an earthquake comes, it's what kills everybody inside. It collapses on top of them, and uh, for, we don't know why a lot of earthquakes seem to happen, happen early in the morning. Um, anyway, what we did, one of the things I knew was we could take local building techniques, but just adapt them a little bit uh, and make them safer. And in this case here, we just took the timber frame of the uh, structure reinforced it so it had more seismic capacity and, and its ability to uh, absorb energy. And that's what we did. So I knew there were things we could do to sort of make it a better uh, building and that we were doing, this was a scale in where, and could become a demonstration project. So it wasn't just about this project, it was about being a demonstration project for the region and internationally and it certainly gained a lot of attention. Another reason I agreed for us to do this project was um, I had a, I knew, uh, these are the residences, by the way, for the students. M most of the students actually live at the school for about nine months of the year. It's a, a f minus 30, minus 40 at night, uh, at the coldest time of the year, but during the day, the air temperature is very cold, but the solar intensity is very high. So, I just realized that um, all the high-powered tools that we were using to design very sophisticated tri triple ventilated facades for office blocks in, in uh, London, that same software could be used to model mud brick, you know, uh, lamb's wool insulation, uh, glass, parachutes, one of the available local uh, um, materials, that we could just as easily adopt it to very simple local uh, materials. And we could also introduce some new ideas. And what we did, th this actual wall here, it's glass in front of a wall, uh, a vented wall. And it's called a trom wall. And I'm going to show you, th this is the sort of the four modes, but I'm just going to show you these two first modes. 
But basically, um, during the day, the sun is trapped uh, inside here uh, in this cavity and vents are opened and it sort of heats up the room and it, it also heats up the mud brick. Now we use that sophisticated software to size the thickness of the wall that would just heat up enough during the day so that by night time the heat had moved to the inside of the wall and in night mode would then radiate the heat gain during the day into the spaces. And that, was that thickness of that wall was determined by one of the most sophisticated uh, computer programs we had. And it worked. And we're getting plus 13, plus 14, up to plus 16 degrees in those rooms without any energy input whatsoever uh, while it's minus 30 and 40 outside uh, at night. And that was an incredible achievement. And carried on while I was in China, picked up another a uh, similar sort of school project, this time in Mongolia. And again, wor working with local techniques and understandings and sensitivities about design uh, to deliver a master plan. And that project is uh, currently ongoing and set up with the same model as Ladakh, we, or, uh, as Ladakh School. We're still working on Ladakh. It, we've now been working on it for 15 years. And uh, we're uh, almost finished the secondary school and there's talk about a university as well. And each year we just build enough new program for the first students who went in back in 2002 or three, that they, they move into the new classroom every year. So it's ongoing. Working with the, the client there. So uh, back in the UK, um, I got involved with um, uh, various other architects, um, this first half, by the way, is a bit of a sort of a, a tour before we get on to, to China or onto CCTV, but I'm going to introduce China too. And this is the National Space Science Centre in Leicester in England, uh, where we designed uh, the side of the tower to be removable. These are inflatable pillows. They can be deflated. The steel ribs taken down and new rockets, which are inside the tower, uh, can be slid out and new ones put back in. A practical solution for gaining access, say, every five or ten years. Um, involved in, with OMA in Chicago with the IIT, uh, where we stuck a hundred-year-old railway, um, extremely noisy railway, inside a concrete tube and crammed the new student centre uh, under it uh, to link previously. We filled uh, the no man's land that previously divided the campus and the uh, campus was about to make the decision whether to close and move outside the city or stay. And by uh, introducing this element into the campus, they had an explosion in uh, applications to the university, a 30, 40, 50 percent increase in applications and the students love the centre and it, it linked the two sides of the university. Um, another job with Grimshaws, this time it was in A Coruña. Uh, this is probably one of the most painful projects I ever worked on. It's nearly as deep underground as it is above ground. It's a, an art foundation. And uh, that was a lesson in how difficult Celts can be. Uh, they, the Galicians are also Celts, like myself. Um, stubborn. Um, Casa de Musica. Absolutely, I'm not going to talk about this one today, but a, a beautiful... Uh, project to be involved in, and one of the last ones we completed before uh, went to China. Uh, interesting story behind Castle of the Music was it's actually the design for it was actually a house for uh, one of Rem's clients in Holland, uh, and the client procrastinated so much over the house design uh, that in the end Rem fired the client, and we took that design and uh, realized well it, it, it'll do for a concert hall as well, so it basically got put on the photocopier and exploded up. Um, while we were doing Casa de Musica, over my shoulder, uh, we're watching the, architect, the other teams in OMA, and uh, Chris Carroll, who is known to some of you here, uh, led this project, it's the Seattle Library, uh, and you can see with Casa de Musica and a, a concrete sort of quartzite-like element. <coughs> Uh, and uh, here in Seattle, we ended up with a, a beautiful steel um, element. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And we had lots of other projects in the States, the Whitney Museum project, which Rangel then took from us, and LACMA uh, competition, that's in Los Angeles Museum of <coughs> Contemporary Art, which competition we won, but Renzo also took that from us. Um, and then we get to China. So let me see how I'm doing for time. Okay. Um, in, in this, just between now and the break, I'm just going to talk about sort of personal observations about uh, working in, in China. Um, the whole reason uh, we ended up in China is principally uh, the Olympics, I think, was the, the catalyst for a lot of decisions being made about projects uh, such as the airport and, and others going ahead. So it was certainly the backdrop and the catalyst to a lot of what happened. Um, I think everybody is aware of the incredible dynamic um, growth of China's economy and uh, the aspirations of, of China, uh, of individuals and the country as a whole um, are in, incredible. Um, and also the consequences for, for people and the new China. It's a, an ever-evolving uh, dynamic. I'd like to show this one. Um, this is my little joke. This is the standing committee of uh, the Communist Party standing. And seven out of nine of them are engineers. Now, the big surprise about that is that this is the first time it's not nine out of nine. Okay? And when you understand that, you begin to understand a little bit about what's behind a lot of the decision-making going on in China, about decisions about projects, and the ability to think on a macro scale and, and make very brave uh, decisions, sometimes mistakes, sometimes successful. And one of the reasons I ended up in China was... It, it represents half of the world's built environment. And it's, you know, whatever stage it's at, it's still relevant. And for us as a company, if, if Arab believes what it says, you know, we, we want to shape a better world. I hate, you know, I hate that logo, but it's one of the things we say. Um, then, you know, I had to be there. And, but it was also clear that the importance of the engineering of China's future was critical. And I use the term engineering, and it's engineering design. Um, here is the signing of one of the contracts that we had uh, with clients in China in front of you know, a few well-known individuals. This is how important that the whole issue of the built environment is there. It's, it's right up there, and it's not just at national level. It's of international importance. China is quickly changing. Um, to have a magazine cover like this uh, five years ago would have been unheard of, uh, but yet someone's allowed to put this on the cover of a magazine. This is a waxwork of, uh, of Obama. Um, not so long ago you wouldn't have seen anything like this, but it's also it's, it's curious in that that's what's, what's there, but it's also that um, the... the uh, the country, there's more and more debate going on in the press, and there are organizations such as SIGEN which are opening up uh, discussions about uh, what's going on in a much more open way than was ever, was ever there before. Um, tycoon warning uh, wealth, people becoming wealthy. Uh, greening, you know, I, I spotted this in. Uh, in one of the streets in London recently, it's a uh, Western company's idea of, of green. Um, there's been some horrendous examples of, of that around the world. This is uh, in one city in, in China. But the whole agenda about energy and the environment um, is something extremely important in China, uh, in reality and also uh, strategically. Um, energy independence. Uh, quality of uh, life, quality of food, uh, environmental pollution are shooting up the agenda. And certainly in the years I've been working there, uh, the requirements, say, for something like a facade, facade performance has radically changed and uh, is tightening up. Recycling, another issue. Um, I just thought I'd put these in. This is a, a sandstorm, how it looks on the street in Beijing. 
and uh, the reality at home, and this happens fairly frequently in the early part of the year, it's all part of the, the environment we're working in there. Um, a huge number of people uh, to employ. We all know about the migration from the country to the city. There's still expected two or three hundred million people moving uh, to the cities um, over the coming decades, and employment for those uh, migrating, migrating workers, um, a big issue, and keeping, um, trying to keep some sort of order to a very, very dynamic work environment. Um, this is something I pulled out recently. Um, I think it's, China does have issues, I've said about environment. One of the other issues coming up here, this is 1994, this is the demographic and you have basically a population bubble here that is now coming up, you see here, coming up to retirement age. And this is going to impact hugely on China in the coming decades, uh, not only because there are, people are living longer, but also because this uh, population group is coming up into retirement. Uh, but it's also that, um, with the one-child policy as well, that support of parents and grandparents uh, does come down in a very funneled way onto individuals today. And it does impact in the uh, ambitions and, and uh, behaviour of, of young Chinese uh, people, professionals, workers today. They have uh, a huge weight on their shoulder, on their shoulders, literally. Um, more and more demand for uh, free time, for entertainment, all right, and uh, as I was saying, coming back to the magazines earlier, the, there's a, you know, in the, time, in the time I've been working there, the last eight, ten years, um, there has been an explosion in choice in terms of magazines, but also, as I said, in terms of what they're covering. Um, food, um, I think, is at the, is probably the most important thing to uh, certainly the Chinese people I, I know. And this is uh, one of the meals I was invited to, in, to enjoy in, uh, in the hutongs in Beijing. Um, extremely important part of the day, an important part of, of culture. Right, um, buildings then, building development. This is an OMA slide, I believe, uh, but basically showing the, the history of tall buildings and how it's gradually moving east. And certainly right now we're looking at uh, fi lots, you know, probably half a dozen 500 metre plus towers in places like Beijing, Shenzhen, Shanghai, um, Hong Kong. Um, Asia is definitely the home of the skyscraper. And this is impacting then on, on communities uh, in places like Beijing. This is a family I met in Beijing, fairly traditional looking Chinese family. Um, uh, including one of the uh, grandsons who uh, lives in England and is a student there, in a good chat. But those communities uh, ha are being torn down, um, rightly or wrongly. It's a long debate about that. But for sure, the uh, old part of Beijing um, has probably halved in the last eight years that I've been there, and it'll have again, I'd say, by the time they're finished with it. And so this is a familiar site in Beijing with the symbol Chai for demolishing the old hutongs. And um, history, hundreds of years of history uh, being sort of thrown, cast away. Um, you can't take these stones out of the country. These are the old stones that would have adorned the entrance uh, to a, a hutong, cast in the street and not even, not even worth moving. Just, someone's just concreted up along the sidewalk here. Um, incredible uh, to watch that. And the pace of change, um, sometimes rogue. Uh, this is a building uh, which had a, a classic failure um, where there was someone started to excavate a, a car park in front of it uh, without proper notification. And the building fell over perfectly. Luckily, no one was hurt. Um, some very interesting architecture. Um, both neoclassical um, and this is one of the uh, more common interpretations of conservation in China 
uh, at the moment. It's still, as the old city is disappearing, they, the, um, the means and methods and motivations for conservation are uh, definitely, uh, definitely have room for improvement. Back to some OMA slides. What am I doing for time for the break? Yeah. Um, as you can think, there's, they're saying in terms of sort of as a percentage of population, there's one tenth of the number of architects in China um, doing five times more than, say, an American, but at least 10, 20 times more than a, a British architect uh, per square meter. And what does that, you know, it's a completely different environment to work in. Uh, a raging debate. Is there any such thing as original uh, Chinese design? Uh, Ai Weiwei here says no, and Ma Yansong of Mad Architects um, saying yes. That debate goes on. Uh, for sure, um, there are the, the education uh, of architects in China is changing, uh, and there are uh, a generation as uh, Yong Ho Chang seen as a sort of the, the daddy of the new uh, wave of young atelier, architectural atelier in China, um, alongside more of the younger guys, Ma Yan Song, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, the guys from Urbanus, uh, and this is Ola Sheeran, who's the project architect for, for OMA. Um, there, there, is, there are a number of practices trying to push up the bar in terms of design and design quality uh, in China as Chinese firms. And uh, they will succeed, but they are also frustrated. Um, they, the Chinese, these guys will tell you that the Chinese clients and the Chinese government will not give them the opportunities in the uh, tier one cities. Maybe in the tier two, but more in the tier three. They're struggling. They, some of them may get somewhere, but it'll be the generation after this is, again, uh, all of them, uh, most of the well-known Chinese architects, bar one or two, um, have had overseas training and have mixed that with a, a practicing it back home. Um, it was one of the reasons I went out there, was to work with those guys and help them, uh, work with them in China, but also support them when they got an opportunity abroad. And as soon as I landed in Beijing, um, Mada from, uh, from Shanghai were invited by Renault for the uh, Lyon uh, truck headquarters. And uh, I met one of my colleagues out there. <laughs> so um, very exciting times to be working with them. And also some very interesting working practices. This is um, a communication from Ma Qingyun of MADA, uh, on an airplane, written on a sick bag, photographed, and uh, then texted or uh, sent by phone to us. And uh, some of the other local uh, architects getting stuck into the local way there. Um, I'll put this slide up. Despite everything that's happened, now this slide's a little bit out of date now, it's 2007, but this was very telling. Despite the millions of square meters uh, under design and construction outside in Beijing, it was still the case that a tiny slice in Beijing of the commercially available office space was grade A, as would be recognized by an international client. That everything else uh, was, uh, you know, basically, uh, this would be grade, you know, triple A or whatever. The rest was grade A and grade B. So despite everything that was built and new, there was still going to be a massive demand going forward for, for decades for an improvement of the, the building stock. And the, uh, the tycoons um, receive this sort of uh, in, induction to, to join the, the wealthy, the nouveau riche in, in China. This is an advertisement for your own chateau on the edges of Beijing. Um, literally opposite uh, protests by residents against the compensation they're getting for being evicted for the CCTV building. This kind of uh, poster is now banned in Beijing and uh, anything that sort of um, advertises opulence or uh, extravagance is, is frowned upon. 
And when uh, the uh, Chinese tourists come for the traditional holidays, such as spring and October holiday to Beijing, the phone numbers and the prices on these hoardings are covered up. So Beijing, um, how am I doing? I'll go through this quickly. This is lots of architecture going on. The uh, National Opera, the Water Cube, the airport and the bird's nest, all projects we were lucky enough to be involved in, and China World Train Centre Tower 3. Um, from our, this is our office in Beijing. Outside the window, uh, we were lucky, lucky enough to be involved in about 4 million square metres of development in our first uh, eight years there. And this just gives you an idea of our exposure there. And that's just within the, the city centre. And to sit in, a, sit in my office and, and look out the window at all of this work going on was an incredibly rewarding experience. Some of the other projects we're involved in there, this is the Beijing Bookstore, which never happened. Uh, Shenzhen Stock Exchange Building, which is now under construction. Um, and we were working all over East Asia. This is a project in Singapore. Bangkok, the Korea Pavilion at the Shanghai Expo, and uh, Taipei Performing Arts Centre down in Taiwan. So I'm going to stop there, and uh, there's a break, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to talk about CCTV and the process, and hopefully through that process, describe some of the issues, current issues, in terms of trying to do work in China. I'm not going to be able to cover everything, so please bring it up in the Q&A session if you've got any questions about my views on, on how to actually work today in China. Because when we started, uh, you know, CCTV competition, this is the book cover, uh, it was back in uh, 2002, April 2002, that the project came in. So uh, this, the, my experience is already you know, last millennium, not almost, but... Uh, so, CCTV competition came up, and uh, OMA were presented with the option of do the Twin Towers uh, competition, or do CCTV, and according to REM, they decided that uh, China was the future, and they wouldn't do both competitions, so they would focus on CCTV only. Um, this is the center of Beijing, Forbidden City, the new site is over here in the CBD where our office is, I showed you earlier, and the old center is over there. CCTV currently have about 15 channels and broadcast nationally, but their ambitions are to operate upwards of maybe 200 channels in the future, and, and I'm sure everybody's aware that they have Arabic, Russian, a, you know, a whole international raft of services these days, and they're quickly expanding that. And their current size, their home, uh, which is on the, the site uh, of an old factory in, in Beijing. This is the view from my desk. And uh, the, uh, the new uh, project was to be plotted into the envisaged new CBD area, a landscape of endless high-rises of hundreds upon hundreds of two, three hundred meter skyscrapers. And uh, the, uh, everybody be interested, it, it will be familiar with the, the shape of uh, CCTV. The, um, there's a lot of debate about why, what is it about, and OMA have not officially, formally, sort of written about why. So the following is my own personal view, and based on my, uh, my, my years of experience with OMA. Um, CCTV is an object, and it very much is a, a, you know, a sculptural object to me. Um, it has its background in, in uh, this is the hyperbuilding project. That we, uh, it was a conceptual design for 50,000 uh, population building in, uh, in Thailand with everybody interconnected. Uh, you can see structure being used to, to triangulate itself and truss itself up here. Um, and the Togok project, a, a real project for a client in, in Korea, um, a headquarters building for a firm where they wanted to have everybody within, I think the, the brief said about five, ten minutes of each other uh, as a circulation diagram. 
It also has its history, I believe, in, in this, this is the Universal Headquarters building in LA. It was never built, but it basically took uh, four diverse uh, businesses of Universal and put them together in one building. And basically the, the businesses were organized horizontally and they were skewered by common program. And the whole idea was that by mixing the four businesses through these common program, that they may generate a fifth business that nobody had even thought of yet. Uh, so it was very much an experiment, but uh, frustrated, of course, by the fact that architecture can, cannot keep up with, with uh, the, the speed of, at which companies change, and the company changed before it ever got off the ground. Um, this is a, a diagram I created. Um, CCD certainly has its shape, certainly evokes a pyramid and it's uh, seven cuts out of a pyramid to generate the shape. Uh, the shape is also about the whole story of the race for height, the uh, monotonous race for height, I think is what Rem would call it. You have the, the whole build up to how high is the Burj Dubai, this is at a conference in Dubai I was at, you know, and you, you have a look and you peel back uh, the numbers and find it says 800, and in the end it was 860 meters or whatever. Uh, and a building that has the exact same square meterage as CCTV. Another idea there in, in the shape of CCTV was this endless loop uh, and the, um, the a ability, if part of that loop was removed or became dysfunctional, of still maintaining circulation and essential services to all parts of the building. So, you know, it, I'm sure in the future we'll know more about why. Um, we did the competition, we were doing competitions all the time with OMA and uh, we were about three or four weeks from the deadline and we still didn't have an idea of, of what sort of structure we were going to have uh, to achieve uh, the architecture, uh, to achieve the, the, the sculptural shape. You can see some examples here, this is sort of a Bank of China type element. This one here was where we mixed it with concrete and a sort of a, a random skeletal steel. We had no idea and we were getting a bit frustrated and we looked back, uh, Sho Shigematsu, one of the partners now at OMA, said, what about the Whitney? He'd worked on the Whitney and uh, he said, what about the Whitney? You know, we did a skin surface analysis of that which we used uh, the, the directional force in this sort of twisted tube uh, uh, proposition to help determine the layout of windows um, and to let light into the, into the galleries. And he said, why don't we do that? And I said, well, it's, you know, it, it's not a shell, but uh, hold on, you know, uh, why don't we just randomly triangulate the surface of the building and have a look at that? And we did, and um, we found, of course, a, a distribution of forces under gravity and seismic uh, with a massive variation, of course. The red areas are the ones working really hard and the blue uh, the least hard. And we said, look at this, you know, it's a quite unusual, why don't we try and rationalise it in some way? So we made up a little model, it was that big, and uh, I got out my pen and we drew on it, and we basically rationalised it into zones of, of, of uh, different intensity of force in, in this uh, imaginary structure. And we said, okay, in a, where it's working particularly hard, we'll add structure and where it isn't, we'll reduce it. But instead of just making elements bigger or smaller, we said we'll just change the density. And so what we did was we doubled or quadrupled the density of the mesh, keeping a uniform member size, uh, and came up with this pattern. And uh, we showed it uh, to OMA, and immediately they went, yes, that's it. And it was it, and it became the principle by which we spent the next two years analysing and reanalyzing, going through iteration after iteration to come up with the final um, pattern. Um, I think, uh, in, uh, partly in Rem's words, it was the seemingly random, uh, contrived nature of the pattern um, that it was actually uh, driven purely by structural logic, but that it was something that the, the lay person wouldn't necessarily see or understand, and even an engineer might have to look and think about it for a little bit because they're very complex uh, three-dimensional um, forces at work here in, in this sort of single structural tube. 
element. I should have started by saying that we knew immediately that we'd have to turn that object into the structure. The cores and everything, the traditional core doesn't play any role at all. It's purely the surface of, of that uh, single tube is the structure. Um, and that ended up there. So the, um, the program of CCD, very complex. Uh, it was put into two buildings. The total po program required, it's about uh, 580,000 square meters. It's about five to 10 times bigger than the current CCTV <laughs> operation. So uh, it reflected also their ambition for the future and what, what they would become. It was basically divided into two buildings, the business and the public. And the public building was TVCC, the hotel, and uh, CCTV was news, production, post-broadcasting administration, uh, studios, etc. And very, very complex uh, programming, uh, which we had to demonstrate actually worked uh, with the shape at competition. And it all came together. These are images from the competition. At, uh, all came together and uh, was put into a booklet. Just to give you an idea of the scale, this is uh, Dublin's tallest building, or, or nearly Dublin's tallest building. Um, and it is, four of those would make up Canary Wharf Tower. And the reason we compare it to Canary Wharf Tower is that the area of space in Canary Wharf Tower in London is equal to one CCTV. And they also, almost exactly the same height. Um, so in the early days, we, uh, when people asked us about CCTV, you know, what is it, how do you make it? And I said, well, take, take four Canary Wharf Towers and uh, take two of them and uh, put them at about 10 degrees sloping towards each other and take another one, just crank it at 90 degrees, stick that in the bottom and the other one at the top. And, and that's, that's, all, that's all there is to it. Um, more images from the competition. We actually proposed high-speed sloping lifts and they slope in one direction only, in the other direction they were vertical. In the end, that dropped out because we couldn't be sure of a competitive tender, um, and it's probably never going to be achieved unless someone uh, decides they're going to invest $30 million in an investment program. Something OMA were very, very aware of and sensitive to in the beginning was the, um, the importance uh, and the playfulness and, and the use of facades in, in contemporary Chinese architecture. And uh, some of these images, these are images from the competition stage showing, uh, demonstrating to the client that there was, there was going to be some play uh, on the facade. And uh, it certainly wasn't just going to be a monotonous element. Uh, some more from the competition. We were trying to break the building down and say, well, it's, it's made up of relatively conventional pieces. It's just it's never been put together before. Um, that's the structural page. Unbelievable, it's all boiled down to this. And this was our cost argument. You know, if uh, the, the only special element over, say, a twin tower solution would be the structure, where there would be a, a, an increase in, in budget for the structure. But other uh, aspects of the design wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be affected by the shape, and uh, that we could do it within the budget set. <coughs> well, we won the competition. Um, and um, I was in at the, what turned out to be the last meeting of the Whitney Project in New York before we got dropped and uh, came back and uh, at that point I was asked by uh, two of the partners at OMA who were going to take on the project all the sheer and then Ellen Van Loon, how did I feel? And I said 50% sheer terror and 50% sheer exhilaration. Um, it took the next six months to negotiate a contract after we won the competition. Behind the scenes and without OMA's knowledge, we established a structural team of uh, our best, some of our best analysts. And they took uh, what's an incredibly complex structure, um, ultimately, but simplified it down into a very simple four-element stick model um, and started with the simplest of models just to begin to understand the behavior, three-dimensional behavior of, of this structure. So by the time the contract was signed six months later, this team who had been working away on the structure gave us six-month uh, advantage in terms of keeping up with the design schedule because we knew once OMA mobilized, we would be getting very busy. And we began to imagine CCDB's place in the world. Um, 
You can see the reference there to a pyramid and in Asia. And this is uh, one of the uh, first um, images imagining CCTV in the city. Uh, and very accurate it is too. Um, we began to imagine it on site. Others began to imagine it uh, elsewhere. They clearly had, had enough. So, you know, we won the competition, but subsequent to that, we had to win it uh, 10 times more. Um, and the decision about CCTV going ahead went all the way to the Politburo, with the last step being a, a model of the building being put in a van and driven down to Bay Haida. I hope I've said that properly, um, where the Politburo summer uh, and the final decision was made there uh, by the, to go ahead with this project. And un completely unprecedented, and it's not by chance that they allowed us to go ahead. Uh, they were, there was a lot of groundwork by ourselves and by OMA to persuade the client that we did, we would ultimately be able to solve this and to design this building. And it was one that, for us to put, for Arab to put its name on such a, a, a revolutionary a, um, you know, breathtaking project. It was a major decision at the competition based on just three weeks' knowledge. You know, can we put our name to this or not? And in the end, we decided we would. A, a group of us came together and decided, yes, we can make it work. Um, so the client looked very carefully at us and looked at very carefully at OMA. And the reason we got this project, I truly believe, is that we had you know, 20 years of history of uh, living and dying together on projects uh, with you know, complete interdependence between the two uh, companies and the groups of individuals. And I can distill it all down into to one word, trust. That's why you know, we got to do projects like this, like CCTV and everything else. Plenty of others, you know, taking the lead from CCTV, made their own proposals for China, and uh, none of these were ever entertained for, uh, for five minutes or longer. They were just uh, fairly outrageous, but also just there was no thought nor, nor a team behind it. Um, we are international, there's a map of us around the world with uh, offices all over East Asia. Um, but for this project, it, yes, it's a project in China, but it was to be a truly international team. We brought together a team uh, from all the four corners of the company. Uh, we, this is one of the great advantages of the company ownership uh, and operational uh, structure is it's <coughs> relatively easy to mobilize the skills necessary to deliver a project. Uh, and in fact, you're, you're expected to, to bring in the top skills, or the, sorry, the appropriate skills. OMA, at the same time, also built their team. And I think at the peak of the project, there were about 200 uh, architects and engineers uh, working on it through 2003. Um, and at that point, uh, ICADI, the local design institute from Shanghai, joined the team uh, as our, our new friends. You know, whether it's a one-night stand or a long-term relationship. Um, but they were sandwiched, and uh, our, our relationship with them has continued and is, is very good. So it was ultimately a successful uh, relationship. And this will give you an idea of the distribution of the team uh, and where people were coming from and supporting into the project from all over the world. Um, I like to put this up as we're, we're now at this, this stage here. And that's why I'm standing up. So one of the older hands uh, at our put this up on the wall when we built the team and, and we ticked off where we were as we went along over the next uh, few years. So um, the way the project worked, you had it, the in initial scheme design was carried out in a dedicated office in Rotterdam with our team based in London, OMA in Rotterdam, ICADI had engineers in London and architects in, in Rotterdam, and we did scheme design and, and the next stage preliminary design in Rotterdam, working very intensively. Uh, I was basically living in Rotterdam with large numbers of people involved in a continuously uh, uh, evolving agenda uh, with design, design decisions being made, making new friends. This is the senior engineer, uh, Professor Wang from, from uh, Professor Wang Shi from um, Ikadi coming to visit us in, uh, in London. And luckily enough, the team was up and working together quite effectively when SARS came along in 2003. And we were able um, 
to work through it and continue co uh, collaboration with the client. Uh, funny for a media company, the client was almost broke out in a rash when we suggested using teleconferencing or, or video conferencing. They insisted on face-to-face -face meetings. And uh, once SARS was over, the, the client uh, visited uh, us in London, and this is a visit to the Swiss Re building. They wanted to see uh, something of a similar scale. It's also the time of a notorious content book. And again, I mentioned modeling earlier. The importance of modeling to OMA is, uh, uh, is there. Um, I think on purpose, the models we suggested they make uh, were done in small scale. <laughs> But uh, literally hundreds, thousands of models continuously being made. And most importantly, none of them being precious. Okay? Every model that was made, you could rip apart. You know, it was there to be used, not to be looked at. And uh, uh, quite often to the chagrin of many an architect saw their beautiful model being smashed within seconds. Um, I talked about the importance of seismic in... Um, in Japan, it's also something that uh, uh, people in China are very familiar with. This is the, the earthquake um, that happened in, in Sichuan uh, during 2008. And uh, this is uh, the hits on Google uh, during the minute si silence uh, a week after the earthquake uh, in China. And it shows you how much it touched people's hearts and, and minds there and the psyche of the country. So CCTV, um, luckily it, it broke practically all of the codes and all of the uh, standard ways of doing uh, tall buildings in China. So immediately we're in a situation where engineers love to be working from first principles. And so the code books don't cover uh, such buildings. So you start from, from first principles and a committee was established from, by the Ministry of Construction, 13 experts, and uh, through a series of maybe 50 uh, private, uh, official private, unofficial private, and then official meetings. Um, we gained <coughs> approval over an 18-month process with the, um, with the Ministry of Construction for the structure. The, o the other approval process that was particularly long uh, was uh, on fire engineering, which we also were involved in. And b basically what we did, we had to set objectives and basically, we didn't, it wasn't just about sort of determining what load goes here or there. We actually had to demonstrate that we understood how a building behaved in an earthquake. So not, it wasn't just about forces. We needed to understand millisecond by millisecond how buildings behaved. And we had to set out this whole, the objectives, the philosophy and design uh, methods. Um, it was all state of the art work. It was analysis work that could not have been undertaken only a few years before that point in time we were designing it. And we were allowed to bring in a, um, approaches and expert advice and relevant codes from all over the world. And basically we, we had to write our own code for how to design a CCTV in China, get that approved by the Ministry of Construction, work to that, analyze to that, come back to them, discuss the results you know, adjust the objectives and, and the requirements. And uh, it was a fantastic non-political process, a very real process. A lot of people might imagine, well, it's just a rubber stamping exercise, or, you know, it, it's not real, or they're going to stand in your way. No, it was engineer to engineer. And uh, I, I'll tell you, I, I think it made the architects jealous that uh, we were able to, to work so well together. Um, these are one of the basic objectives. The building was designed uh, to deal with an everyday earthquake with no damage. And then in the extreme event, uh, is what we call life safety, i.e. no collapse, and uh, sta stages in between. I won't go into these. We use state-of-the-art software, as I said. Uh, this is software that uh, was developed when we were driving trains into nuclear flasks uh, and also um, doing car crash simulation uh, using uh, software such as Dyna. At the end of the day, we were able to build, uh, we build three or four different models using different software to cross-correlate the results against each other. We had to be able to model every single one of the 10,008 structural elements that make up CCTV millisecond by millisecond and understand the performance at all levels under all load cases uh, in their entirety and the performance of the building in the ultimate limit state and beyond that when it went plastic and uh, in a severe earthquake when it would be 
uh, suffer damage but, but not collapse. And uh, the software, soft power needed to do that was incredible. Something as complex as that needs to be communicated very simply. And we use this dress pattern um, approach, which, OMA, which we adopted from OMA, um, and use that to present both to lay people, to architects, to the client, and to professors and experts and engineers, all using the same method of uh, communication. It was a hugely successful way of communicating what was happening in the building. Um, I put this slide in. Every single element in the building had to be demonstrated to be working at, his, at its optimum. No steel uh, was going to be wasted and we were very much aware that we had to, to uh, keep the steel weight down. Um, some of the more Hilarious moments where one professor was jumping up and down saying the, the tip here is going to vibrate. So we did what's called the rugby t club test. Uh, it's basically the maximum number of people you can get to jump up and down in pure synchrony together is about 50. It's a, normally a rugby club that do this. And uh, so we did the rugby club test and, and showed them that uh, the building wasn't going to go anywhere under a live load. Um, I think under the rugby club test it's only one millimetre or whatever. But uh, under all the other load cases, we demonstrated that uh, no one was going to experience any movement uh, or any acceleration or get very excited uh, while up there. Um, at that point in time, uh, terrorism didn't exist in China officially. Uh, it does, but it didn't. Uh, but we did have to examine robustness, and it was yet another benefit of the structural system we had come up with that we found that we could add and remove elements First of all, that would give it robustness, so if an element was removed or failed for any reason, the forces would find another way to flow around uh, the removed structure. And uh, as, we went, as we gained knowledge and understanding of the project and got further through scheme design, preliminary design, we started with uh, quite complex uh, computer uh, models, again using state-of-the-art software, backed up with physical testing in labs. And that's true for the columns as well, where we were um, doing quite sophisticated things with concrete and steel that had never been done anywhere else in the world. We also had to show that uh, we understood uh, the built-in stresses due to the uh, building's construction. We had to, during the uh, design, uh, take account of different possible construction methods. In the end, we decided that the contractor would build the towers up and then cantilever out and meet. But we also examined these other two options. Uh, this would have been a bit of, bit of fun. Um, so we went with this one, and our design uh, was based on that. And uh, funny enough, uh, the contractor, the winning contractor, chose that method. Of course, uh, the reality of uh, linking up two 100-ton pieces of steel that are moving about due to temperature and wind movements to each other, uh, 160 meters up in the air, is, a, is not that uh, easy. Um, and then when you think about it, if you, if you build one of the towers overnight and then switch, uh, switch gravity on, sorry, if I go back, this is the theoretical shape of one of the towers on the overhang. If you actually build it up taking no account of the fact that it leans, by the time you've built it, it'll be in that shape. So you actually have to build it like a banana backwards uh, so that when you switch gravity on, it ends up where it's supposed to be. Now, it's as easy as that. All right. Um, there are a large number of American, Chinese uh, 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 professors and engineers were tearing their hair out trying to work out how to do this, but in the end they got it. Um, another part of our uh, work, we determined that uh, they had to connect the two parts of the building at, uh, in the early hours of the morning when the building was cold and of a uniform temperature. Uh, in our specification, we said 5 a.m. to 6.30. In the end, it was about 8 a.m. in the morning. And the contractor determined that seven or eight pieces linked simultaneously uh, would do the trick. And uh, that's what happened later. Um, we had to look at, you know, we were very conscious that um, everybody was comparing CCTV steel weight to other buildings. Uh, we, we, went, we showed this to the client. This is a height on this axis, sorry, it's disappeared, uh, versus a steel weight. 
it's not the lightest building in the world, but certainly it's in, it has plenty of, of company and in terms of uh, higher steel weights, it's, there are plenty ahead of it. But more importantly, we wanted to compare it with uh, buildings in seismic zones. And this is CCTV given its number of stories. So there's a sort of a line here. So we weren't too far uh, off uh, the line in terms of efficiency. But uh, our argument always was, well, the, the alternative design would probably end up being an 80-story building. And uh, you would need that same amount of steel, 250 kilos per meter squared. So that's how we sort of justified it to the client, and they justified it to the government, we justified to ourselves, um, that given what the project was about to deliver an icon uh, to uh, CCTV uh, and an icon for the future of China, we felt it was within reason. One of the scarier moments in the project, uh, a seven meter tall scale model of the, uh, of the building was made by some students using some copper tubing. Uh, and a purpose-built shaking table was made, and the building was, was shaken. Not stirred. To test the design, um, it's, uh, I say it's one of the more scary moments because this is how um, sophisticated modelling is. Now, it's an old technique of, of proving uh, the capacity of, of buildings, but it's still, when you compare it to the accuracy uh, and power of software these days, it's a little bit of a dinosaur, and also the, the accuracy of the modeling is so poor. It could, if you had a failure, it could cause you a lot of problems. Anyway, the model was put in the client's car park and is now the most expensive birdhouse in, in China. <coughs> that brought us to the end of uh, that year, 2003. The site had been cleared. This is our Christmas card. And um, while People in the New York were writing in the New York Times saying that uh, the building was, was not going to happen. Uh, the, the smoke, the local smoke signals uh, were that it was going to happen. In nearly every developer's office in Beijing, there's a model of the CBD area of, 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 China, of Beijing. And there, sitting in those models, was our building. So we knew it was going to happen. Um, also, we did some further tests uh, at my 40th birthday. <laughs> Back in Dublin, you can see the early banana shape there. Uh, someone forgot to switch gravity on. And of course, the secret to building CCTV is a coat hanger. Uh, this approach to engineering was also adopted by the cake shop opposite the site entrance. Um, and uh, you could order for your wedding uh, CCTV or TVCC, uh, five days notice. And I think it cost about 30 or 40 euro. So I'm going to show you a lot of slides now. It's basically the uh, construction sequence. Um, and what I'll do, instead of talking about working in China, hopefully someone will ask about factors of t working today in China during the Q&A session, and I'll cover it then, because I want to get through these as well. So we had groundbreaking in 2004 after a, a, almost a one-year delay um, due to some political uh, questioning as to the value of all of the Olympic projects. Um, the project was set up on site in a very traditional main contractor, subcontracting uh, situation. Um, this is the uh, schedule. By the way, if anybody wants papers on CCTV, uh, you can get them off the Arab, uh, Arab uh, website. There's one on the structure, one on the uh, services, and one on construction. That's the schedule, but basically showing how quickly everything was achieved. Some were inspired by the shape uh, to produce art pieces um, and uh, some more political texts started doing the rounds in Beijing as it, as it went up. Um, the, the power of the internet uh, in China is incredible and uh, people are using it more and more to express all sorts of views. Uh, and this is one of the typical texts doing the rounds during the last few years. Um, and, and other caricatures, not, <laughs> not, so, not so nice, but uh, the, the project is fondly known as the Big Pants, Da uh, Kuchar, in, in Beijing. Uh, and also, um, you know, my, having uh, two young sons. You know, we uh, could smash the real the fact, Westminster uh, Abbey so it looks like this. The Simpsons uh, w was a highlight oh, for me. Oh, there are no them. flights to London till um, five. So they uh, were able Welcome to Welcome to Springfield mates. Elementary's next top model they were on the building Simpsons. contest. Kenny, he said your show. Uh, 
Oh, I watched it once. Now, judges, start your nodding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Flawless, stunning, so. awe-inspiring, meticulous. Okay, so that was the moment of fame, and uh, I'll tell you, for all the, all my kids have put, been put through, uh, they forgave me when that came out. So construction shots, um, the early days, this is the piling going on. The tops of the piles being removed by hand, by hand. And this was the only point in the project at which it looked like a project in China, really. Because after uh, the labor intensive sort of uh, in the ground bit, it then, the population of the site went from 2,000 down to about four or 500 people who knew what they were doing. And it was world class a piece of a construction by China State um, building what can only be an international standard uh, steelwork project. And this is the view again from my, from my desk. So I was lucky enough to be out there by this stage and, and watch the daily things going on. Um, this is one of the base columns uh, which may experience uplift in an earthquake. So it has, that's, the, that's the top of the foundation, the raft. And it's a seven meter deep uh, concrete pour it's been embedded into. Preparing of the lift pits, waterproofing. <coughs> and then began a, the largest a concrete pour in China's building construction industry history. Uh, over 48 hours casting the raft under one of the towers uh, with uh, 200 trucks constantly on the move delivering 40,000 cubic meters of concrete. Uh, at a very fast pace, no one seems to know which way to run, uh, and I'm told there's a lot of telephones in there, uh, and hopefully nothing else. 24, 48 hours later, cover it up, put it to bed, and uh, a day later, they started again and did, a, did the other, other raft. And uh, that brought us to the end of the winter of uh, 2004 or five, was that, yeah. In the foreground here, you can see TBCC, the hotel, flying up. And the first uh, steelwork arriving uh, on site. Um, about 10,000 uh, pieces of structural steel, all fabricated in China using plate up to 100 mil thick. And uh, every single one of them coded, completely understood, checked, tested, and then uh, driven uh, 12, 24 hours uh, from the fabrication yards to site in, in Beijing uh, and uh, erected. Every single piece examined on site, checked all the bolts and necessary bits and pieces uh, go along with it and lifted into place. And frequent visits, uh, unfortunately a bad photo of Dong Mei Yao, the, one of the project architects there, uh, Ola and Rem, frequent visitors to site. Progress in the early days was pretty slow. Um, so these are some of the expresses on the columns. Um, this, that, that is 13 meters long. It took uh, 72 hours to weld uh, that piece on there. And where the columns, where one column was added onto another, they took uh, up to typically 48 hours, two days of continuous welding by a team. Um, to do the columns. All done, you know, a lot of the work was done by very skilled, uh, skilled workers, some of them enjoying themselves on site, some, for some it was too much, others it was quite relaxing. Um, the workers had their insurance policy follow them all around the site. Uh, there were two shrines, um, which basically were always at the, uh, the most dangerous part of the uh, work on site and constantly moved and towards the end of the project these shrines were uh, at the tip uh, before the, the joining and offerings were made there every day and uh, particularly during um, traditional uh, holidays. So we watched it go up quick. At first it uh, was relatively slow but once they got the hang of it and delivering the steel and putting it together uh, it was going up at a rate of uh, four floors Four, four floors a week, uh, so it was. It really flew up, and I'll show that later, hopefully in a video. Mm. 
So, um, it was 24 hour working. Hmm? It was 24 hours working? Yes, 24-hour working, and because the welding is, is around the clock, it, you know, it, uh, it looked like a, a Christmas tree all the time, with weld sparks flying everywhere, day and night. Uh, very spectacular, making quite an impression on everybody. And uh, regularly we would see pile-ups on the third ring road with people rubbernecking while driving. Um, and then it reached, reached the top of the towers and then, uh, then started one of the most spectacular bits of uh, building uh, that probably the world has seen. And it evokes uh, some of the images uh, of the 30s skyscrapers in, in America, uh, with the steel workers beginning to cantilever out 160 metres up in the air over uh, Beijing, putting the, uh, putting the building together piece by piece. Uh, another thing we had done with the superstructure, we had designed it to, to support itself and to build, you could build off it. So it was, um, in terms of temporary works, it was relatively straightforward. Um, male and sometimes female uh, workers there. And bit by bit, worked out to the point in space on the day of uh, the linking. And it was there the, the day one of the guys first stepped over. And uh, shortly after that, there was a ceremony where the um, pieces were finally sized up 24 hours uh, before a cut to within one millimeter tolerance, uh, slipped into place and connected by uh, pins initially, and then welded together. And uh, two buildings became one. Um, yeah, there it is. Uh, lots of graffiti all over the site. Um, and this is one we, we liked. Uh, other building, oh, this is the service building on the site which was completed. And uh, CCDB. So it was visible to all uh, from all over the city. Um, the Sichuan earthquake happened one day. Uh, while it was under construction and everybody came down and went back up afterwards. A lot of them left site then because they were concerned a lot of the workers were from Sichuan and they went home to do what they could. I like to, it to be noted that on St. Patrick's Day the, the final piece of uh, perimeter steel work was put in. And there were one or two pieces of steel uh, we didn't put in until after the superstructure was complete. Um, it was basically to predetermine load paths for the very complex flow of uh, forces in the structure, uh, topping out ceremony. After the structure was complete, the facade took over uh, as being the centre of attention. The facade was designed to, to sort of look like it was the facade in a normal day or a good day. It also took reference from the uh, temporary works that is used on uh, many of the neighbouring buildings. And so the facade was designed basically just slightly off, the dull, off grey, so that it looked sort of similar whether it was dirty, clean, on a good day or a bad day, but still had the same representation. And the, with the uh, bracing pattern for, of the structure being the hard line expressed in the, in the final facade design. And that was it at the end of 2008. Uh, the model was reality. Can I keep going? Right. Only five. Right. Beijing Olympics came along and uh, the building was ready. Uh, the symbols of the Olympics were projected up against the facade. It was used as the backdrop for uh, coverage by CCTV. Uh, lots of light bulbs were stuck in it at night to make it look like it was operating. And uh, it's beauty, you know, in, from the streets, from every angle in the city, uh, making quite an impact on everybody who visited. It's a building that looks different from every angle. You turn around and you see it in so many uh, different ways. This is a, a sort of a compilation of the shots from my window over the few years. It doesn't run for very long. I should say, in the, in the latter stages, once we had done scheme design, preliminary design, we moved the whole team out to Beijing. And I think in terms of 
models for delivering uh, de design in China in the future, your presence on the ground is incredibly important and having a good mix of international and local staff able to deliver is important and who are mobile. So. <coughs> I'm going to show um, one other video after this as well and then we'll probably call it a day. Right. Now I'm not going to show this other one. It's a, it's a, a time lapse where we, we had two versions. We had one that had real Beijing weather and we had one that we only took the sunny day images. It depended on whether we were trying to recruit the person to work in Beijing or not. <laughs> After the, the building was completed, the, the facades function as a, as a reflector uh, of the beautiful, the few sunny days we got, suddenly became the, the reflector to something much more serious. Um, firework display by the client uh, on site using in industrial uh, fireworks. Started uh, a fire uh, in the insulation on the TVCC building, which uh, turned into the uh, most spectacular. Um, that one's not working, is it? No. Yeah, turned into the most spectacular uh, skyscraper fire and uh, it went on for about four hours and at the end of it uh, the building was destroyed. Luckily CCTV was not affected. Um, at that time I noticed Iwebe's blog is in a book form out here. I just noticed it last week but uh, this was his slightly cheeky uh, comment about CCTV carrying on the, uh, the flame of the Olympics, the Olympic fire in the coldness of a recession. There's up a hope and declare there's hope. Um, CCTV had to fall on their sword within 24 hours and apologise to the nation for burning their own building down. Um, it was not a very good time, not a very happy time for, for many of us to see a project that we had worked on uh, destroyed uh, so carelessly. And. Uh, it was sitting there rusting away and that photo was taken last week. It's now uh, been rebuilt and it will be uh, complete. So um, it'll probably take another two years to finish it. <laughs> and I can stop there if you want or I can show one other thing. Show yeah? Thing. Yeah? Okay. Um, we did this project and it comes back to sort of learning and having a bit of fun. You know, we did CCTV in London and I thought, you know, what the hell do you do next, you know, after sort of doing a competition and winning and delivering CCTV with one of the biggest building teams we'd ever had in the company? And, and the answer to that was go to China. Um, but in China, you know, the scale, everything's 10 times bigger. So in our books, a small project is anything less than 100,000 square meters. Um, medium is two to 300,000. Big to large is over 500, and mega is 1 million square meters. And I think I showed in the little thing earlier about the four or five million square meters outside of our window. A significant number of our projects are bigger than one million square meters. So this was the antidote to all of that. Um, this is the Sisue facade, which Jan Worm showed last week. Um, and uh, basically, it's a 2,400 square meter facade. Uh, with 2,400 pixels, so every pixel is one square meter. During the day, it is a, a pattern uh, uh, based on tilting, but also uh, it is glass with integrated uh, photovoltaic cells. So it's meant to be, uh, this is a fish restaurant behind, by the way, and uh, it's meant to evoke a sort of a watery motif during the day. We decided to do this project. There was a fee, it was never enough to do what we wanted to do. But uh, we were determined to do it, and again, we brought in, it, it was fun. We were working with an Italian architect based in New York, with uh, a team in London, myself in Beijing, um, other members of the team in Beijing, and uh, a lighting designer who was sort of floating between New York and, and London within our team. And uh, it was a, a, a labor of love, putting this uh, facade together. 
Again, we had time uh, to test, and this is early um, computational, very sophisticated computational testing of how uh, this, the, these um, units will work. It's basically an LED projector behind the photovoltaic panel and how it will look. Uh, computer simulation backed up then by physical modeling uh, to prove the, the thesis and construction, uh, installation, testing of li the lighting uh, intensities on site, adjusting, writing the software. It was meant to be a, a video, a, an art, art video wall. So the idea was uh, that you could take it as a canvas, um, design a, a piece of video art around it, and then display it, which is what eventually happened. And uh, so it was fun. And we got to put up a, one or two motifs, in, including our own, at the end. So that's it. That's where I'm going to stop. Oh.